Welcome back to the morning show here on the Arise News Channel. On February the 2nd of 2020, Nigeria raised its value added tax regime from 5% to 7.5%. After a few weeks of public discontent, Nigerians were settling down to that reality before coronavirus appeared on the scene. And since then, Nigeria, including the government and the citizens, have been dealing with the emerging devastating reality. Nations all over the world have also, in their own various capacities, been dealing with the COVID-19 challenge. And much of what a lot of them have embraced is reduced taxation on goods and services. But there is a view in the land that rather than go with the global flow, Nigeria has been moving in the opposite direction. With a steady uptick in revenue generation and the attendant squeeze on the pockets of the man in the street. To get a deeper insight on this. We're now being joined from our Rice Abuja studio by Mary Ikoko, a strategic communication and development consultant. Good morning, Mary, and welcome to the morning show. Thank you for joining us. Well, quickly, uh, Mary Ikoko, I'd like to ask you, yes, I'd like to ask you how country, <laughs> because this is what this is all about. Uh, Nigerians are saying at a time that other countries are giving palliatives and providing support Nigeria has had to uh, increase electricity yeah. tariffs, and now we've also had the removal of uh, subsidy on uh, fuel. What's your take on these two major issues? Well, the, it's just an unfortunate uh, conversation, really. And I wish it would have been the other way around, that we're able to fit in and really apply what is the global best practice at a time like this, you know? So now you have countries of the world are looking for ways and policies with, through which they can ameliorate the pain that the pandemic have put on the people. Um, the Nigerian government, on the other hand, is maybe looking for more ways to shore up uh, the money that they could use to service um, the infrastructure that I'm not even we are not really seeing. Um, I also think that uh, people are going through a lot of pain and hardship. So we have a country dealing with a pandemic, a country dealing with um, a very slow-paced economic growth, a country dealing with um, uh, some kind of inflect, uh, recession, even though they said we've come out of it. Uh, but I haven't, we haven't quite felt that in, in reality that we are out of it. But economists have said we have come out of recession. And then we are also dealing with um, a lot of multiple taxation. We are dealing with all, all manner of, you know, issues. Then you wake up when people are expecting that there will be some level of, um, you know, cushioning effects to to help citizens around this the pain that even the first lockdown has put on the people, put on the economy, taking businesses out of. Uh, taking people, especially this um, informal sector, out of businesses. So we thought that is what we should have been looking at and not an increase in VAT and multiple taxation and all of the issues that we have to deal with. It's really a sad and an unfortunate um, um, situation. And one hopes that the government is really looking at the issue and being a bit sensitive and be able to also... Um, even communicate these, their policies in a way that Nigerians even understand what they are trying to, to do or achieve in the long run. Because the, it's a double jeopardy for a lot of citizens where you're having the breadwinner is out of job, the woman who oftentimes fills up the, uh, the informal sector of the economy, are also not, they are all struggling. And then they, they get knocked at their doors. Oh, we want you to pay tenement rates. Some people say 97000 a year. Where do you want that person to get that money? And it all boils down to our politics and our economy. So it was said that there's really a nexus between the politics of a people and the economic performance of the people. So what we can see now is that if, uh, being, uh, reason being that, I always heard that from Dr. Ezek Wesley, who's an, uh, a strong economist you know, and I defer to her. She, you know, it is saying that what this means simply is that if our politics is good, it just stands to reason that your economic performance will be great. But when you have to struggle with people and leaders who do not uh, make 
um, create the kind of market that is free enough to also balance uh, the process, the whole society, that you don't have to keep taxing people up and down, then we are back to square one. That's why we are dealing with all these arrays of issues that uh, instead of cushioning the effect, mm. we are actually having to deal with a feeling like if there's a whip brought out to really whip us the more. Okay. If I understand you correctly, you're saying you know. that we cannot tax our way out of this crisis, but unemployment will continue to rise. Absolutely. Uh, you know, businesses will continue to need support. The government will continue to need uh, spending to address this crisis, whether it's the health or economic crisis. So my question is, one, where would the money come from for the government to do this? And secondly, you talked about communication. How better can the government explain these choices to the people to command their support, to command their buy-in into this? Yeah. First of all, you know, the tax regime is killing businesses. Now, if you are having a tax regime that is killing businesses in some way, you also need to look back and say how what would be the alternative? Because it's not all about taxing people. And when I'm talking about these taxes, we're even talking about it's just not the tax. It's even about the multiple taxation. You are taxing people 7.5% on VAT. The same organization is also charging sales tax. What's the difference between VAT and sales tax? This, you're charging the same thing from the same person, the same customer. Do you understand? So we have to look at these things critically. How can government be able, I think what government needs to do, first of all, is to create markets, develop markets that will thrive and be sustained. I love what the government has done with the ease of doing business. I love that. Now, that is one way to create markets, right? You bring on investors. People come and invest here. Then... How is it that, did we think about these things when you bring in investors, which is good. Ease of doing business should be a continuous thing. It should be a process that keeps going on. So you ease the space by letting me come into Nigeria to do business. And then I come in, and then every day someone is looking at my door. This tax, that tax, that's that when they should actually be getting, you know, rebates and all, 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 uh, all tax breaks. So I think that, how government can really um, uh, uh, open up this economic space. I think, first of all, the market space. Let's look at this government could have actually said, we will have our areas of priorities. We can say one is power. What is the problem with power? How can we make sure that the power, the, 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 the market of power is also uh, demonopolized? Because what we have today is, um, in Abuja, you have the AEDC. In Lagos, you have the Eco Discos. You have all these discos. And there are, these discos are monopolies. In Abuja, there's no other disco to challenge AEDC, uh, Abuja disco, right? Now, that is somewhat of monopoly. Then government, the regulator is there. So I think what the regulator could have also done was the two things he could have done is to say, OK, uh, the discos we've licensed in the first five years run on your program, go ahead, make your, uh, rebuild your infrastructure, the recoup your investment, don't pay tax or pay this much, get some breaks. Then after five or six years, you can say, we are going to license one or two more um, discos to open the space, there be competition that will drive the market. But that in itself, it, it may not work with this regime. You can also say, let's also bring another as, uh, third, another sector, which could be the macos. So you have the 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 the, the, the gencos, the the discos, the ones that are, are transmission company, and then you can have the macos, which is a, another part which are marketing power. So the marketing companies, what their job will now be to will be to take power from discos and then sell to Nigerians, and they can also focus on making sure that every Nigerian house have, um, what do you call it, metering. Because right now you are still charging people estimated bill, which is neither here nor there. I think it's just allocate, allocated bill because I don't know how they base those estimations. So if you do that, I think it isn't a natural processes, even in the oil and gas sector, 
at, the, but at some point, it will take a while. But what you will now get is a situation where it is the market force that is driving the pricing and not government waking up to increase the price, the, the tariff of uh, electricity. So I think that, one, we need to get our leadership structure very well and make sure that the people we are getting into leadership position have the right kind of competencies, they are capable, they have capacity, and they have courage to deal. Because this is what I feel is lacking here, the political will to really get things done in this okay, country. Okay, I'm not I'd like saying to that in. everything like to should be given to us for free. I mean, you're making a lot of arguments that people are looking at and they're, wow, strongly, because... Nigerians have never paid cost-reflective tariff all this while. This is the first time Nigerians are going to pay cost-reflective tariff. And if you look at it, as the name implies, it is cost-reflective tariff. If you juxtapose it with other countries in Africa, it is the reflection of what you will pay. So it's not like it's a slammed cost. You talked about taxation. A lot of people say the argument is the tax-to-GDP ratio is low. We have about the lowest in the West African sub-region. Benin Republic here, that they say is the 37th state of Nigeria, has a tax to GDP ratio of 15%. Mm. That is even higher than us. So when you say all of this, a lot of people want to make, you know, you, they want to understand your arguments even better. Hello? Hello, Mary, are you can, still with us? Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, they want to understand the base of your argument that you say we shouldn't tax because, but the tax to GDP ratio is low. And you're talking about cost-reflective tariff, as the name implies, it's cost-reflective tariff. How do you even get more people to diversify the sector in a high interest rate environment? How? Well, it's, it's, really, about, it's really about the process. That's what I'm talking about here. You, you, you can't keep tasking. Okay, people who are paying these taxes... The, the very basic tax that are consumer tax that everybody really is paying in this country. If you have to buy water, you buy vegetable, or buying anything consumable, is the VAT. And the people who are buying this, uh, these items, where, how, uh, how, when you haven't yourself as a government, I think the, the point I'm making here is that there should be a, a, a better process to doing things in such a way that you do not continue to um, put hardship on the people. I am not saying you should not task, but I'm saying stop multiple taxation. It is extortion on that people call multiple taxation. You are extorting the citizens. How can I pay VAT and I still pay and I still pay sales tax? People are knocking at people's doors. People are, are, I mean, you come and knock at my door and ask me to pay tenement rates. And then I ask you, what do I get in return? I tell you, people will pay their taxes if the government is responsible in utilizing the funds from those taxes. And it's not taxes that will go the way of corruption. Those are not the tax. How do you really, do you really believe in your mind that these taxes we are paying have been properly utilized to building critical infrastructure, to making sure that our children goes to, go to school uh, in record time and in good time and, and at no charge to us? What is my tax benefit? I pay tax. Uh, I, and then I wake up, my gas is working, my, my, the street light in my place is, is on. Would I complain? It is just the irresponsibility and how citizens are not seeing the output, what this tax is doing for you. Because there are people who truly, really pay taxes in this country. There are those taxes that are deductibles from their salaries, and some are doing businesses and they're paying. And there are also a whole bunch of people who don't think they need to pay tax. I don't have words for such people. But when people pay tax, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't be taxing people anyhow. I don't want to talk about the telcos and the multiple taxation that they go through. Is it the oil and gas sector? Is it the individuals that I've just cited that even private citizens, that you have to, if you go and buy drinks, you pay sales tax and pay VAT. What, what is the meaning of that? Can't, government, I believe, uh, like I said earlier, they've done so well with the ease of doing business. But you also want to retain those people who have opened up businesses in Nigeria. And one way you can retain them is not by helping them up with so many taxes. No. But one way, what you can do is to just ensure that their businesses thrive. You give them tax break. But there are people who will always pay the taxes. But to get people into the country to do business create the enabling environment for those businesses to thrive. And the example I've just given to you is actually the same thing that happened in the telecom sector. 
how many subscribers do we have today? There's a free market. It was competition that dictates the price. I remember when uh, MTN SIM card or any of those GSM SIM cards were what 35,000 naira. So there is for nothing. And this is what market, let market determine the price. Because mm. this monopoly oh. does not help anybody. The same way our politics oh. is kind of playing a kind of uh, monopoly politics. It doesn't help, whether it's in the economy, whether it's in the health sector, whether it's in politics. Well, That's just my what, point. What is certain is that there are many sides to this uh, conversation. Then we want to thank you very much, Miri Koku, for joining us this morning on The Morning Show.